All right, everybody. Hope you guys are doing well. We're back in Colossians again tonight. Looking so forward to it. We're going to do the second section of Colossians 1 here, starting in verse 12. So let's pray and we'll get started. God, we thank you so much for this time. You've been so faithful to us, God, and I pray that you would lead us tonight, that you would speak to each heart. I know that you've been preparing us this whole past week to speak to us and say what you want to say to us. So I pray that you would do that and help us to step into what you want for us and your call for our life. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So awesome. So last week, first part of Colossians 1, we talked about this great gift that God has given to us. And we talked about in stepping into this gift, what that looks like. Because when someone gives you a gift, how are we supposed to respond to that gift? What is the proper etiquette for this gift that God has given to us? And that's where we pick it up in verse 12, where it says, Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, it was because of him that he allowed us to step into the light, that he gave us this glorious gift. It wasn't of our own. We talked about this a couple months ago in Ephesians, how it, it wasn't from our doing. It's a free gift of God so that no man can boast. There's not enough works that you can do. He says that all your best works are like filthy rags. They mean nothing, but it's because of the grace of God and his great mercy on each one of our lives that we can even have a relationship with him. He has crossed the chasm. He's created a bridge for us to go right to the Father. We no more, we no more need a priest or an icon or anything else to get to the Father, to get to God, to pray to God. But we have this great high priest in Jesus that has crossed that chasm for us, that we can go right into the Holy of Holies and that we could speak directly to the Father, to Father God. So in that, in this great gift that God has given us, we have now become Christ's dominion. We were once in the dominion of darkness, as Paul says here. We were owned by darkness. We were lost in our sin. But God, in paying that price, price for us, gave us this glorious gift in letting us step into the light. That we're no longer owned by darkness. We're, we're no longer owned by our sin and our shame. But we are owned by Christ. And Paul says that we become servants of him. And I know a lot of people don't like that word to be a servant or to be a slave. But we're all a slave to something. A lot of us are a slave to our own sin. We're a slave to our own fear. We're a slave to many things in life. So how much greater to be a slave of God? He says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's the only thing in the whole world that can say that. That can say, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Because everything else comes with a burden, doesn't it? All these things that we're chasing after, all these fleshly sins that we run after, and we get these things, and then all of a sudden there's this burden and there's this shame that comes upon us. And we have this great yearning in our heart. And so what do we do? We go out and we do these things again, don't we? We go out and try to satisfy that flesh again, just so we can have that rush and feel good about ourselves again. But it only digs us deeper and deeper into a hole until there's nothing that can help us climb out of this hole except for the forgiveness and the redemption that is our Redeemer, Christ Jesus. You know, when we get taken out of that hole, when we get taken out of the darkness and brought into his glorious light, there's something that changes about us. 
God doesn't leave us the same. He makes us different and for a purpose that we can be the light and the salt, as he says. We can be the light and the salt to those around us. We can be different in coming out of darkness, the world still being in darkness. We get changed and then we're to go out again in our everyday lives and be that light to the world, showing them that God has changed us and there is something different about our lives. You know, in multiple situations in my life and not of my own doing at all, but this is just what God has done. And it speaks right to this in multiple situations in my life. I've had people speak to the people around me. Actually, I've had people say it to me directly like, Hey, there's just something different about you. Like, what is that? Can you explain that to me? Why are you so much different than everybody else that I come in contact with? And I've had people say the same thing to my wife as well. Like, oh, is, is Colton a Christian? Because there's just something different about him. And at that point, it was before my wife had truly submitted herself to the Lord. And so that kind of caused her to start to think about this. Like, wait a second, like when you come to the Lord, when you're fully in submission to him, God does something different in you. And people notice that. It's palpable that God has created a new thing in you. As Paul says, the old has passed away, the new has come. And that's what he's touching on here again. When you come out of this darkness, you have the light and the Lord makes you different in that. He makes you stand out from the world. And I remember... Jesus talks about this in John 15, about us not fitting in with the world. I remember in my high school days, before the Lord had really gotten a hold of my life, and, and this may be the same thing for a lot of you, but in high school, I remember myself not fitting in. And that's going to sound strange, uh, especially if uh, you knew me in high school, because you know I was an athlete, um, quarterback of the football team for quite a few years, played on the baseball team, played basketball, um, and had an outgoing personality too. And so a lot of people knew me. And I just remember uh, people coming up to me that I didn't even know, and they knew my name. And that always kind of freaked me out because I had never ever seen this person before in my life. And they would walk by me and go, hey, Colton, how's it going? And I'm like, hey. <laughs> but in that time, I don't think there was any more of a time in my life that I felt more alone and more like I didn't fit in with all the people around me. And it's kind of surprising in a high school, because I went to a high school of about 3,000 people. How do you not fit in with somebody? And there were a few people that I totally just clicked with, but majority wise, I just didn't fit in. It didn't feel right to me. And Jesus talks about this in John 15, he says it like this. He says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you as well. And this is so true. And I know a lot of us feel like this in our lives sometimes, like we just don't fit in with the people around us. Well, congratulations. That means the Lord has called you and he is going to do something great with your life if you would just step in to what he has for you. You see, God, he says here, I've called you out of the world. I chose you. I created you to be different. If you were of the world, the world would love you. Everyone would love you. But because you're not of the world, the world hates you and you don't fit in with it just like I didn't fit in with it. You see, if you don't fit in with the world, if you don't fit in with the people around you, that is a great thing. That is something to rejoice about. But if you do fit in with the world and you feel like you just click with the world and they click with you and everything's good and golden, that's cause for caution. Because if you fit in with the world, Jesus says here, 
you are of the world. And if you are of the world, you cannot be of God. He says before that, that is a servant is not greater than his master. You cannot be greater than your Lord. And so if the world hated Jesus, it must hate you as well. But that is cause to rejoice because then we have fellowship with him. Verse 15 says, he is the image, and I want you to, to really pay attention to these next couple of verses because every single line he says in here is super important, each to its own. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, talking about Christ, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now let's break this down, the first part. He is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. That means that God is invisible. No other part of God in his triune nature has an image. It is Jesus only. So that means that when God made us in his image, we were formed after the likeness of Christ. We were formed in the image of Christ because we're not invisible. And if all other parts of God are invisible, only Christ is God's image, then we were made in the image of Christ. So this means that even in the Old Testament, as you go through the Bible, even in the Old Testament, any time someone is speaking face to face or seeing God, they are seeing Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. The image of the invisible God. So, when Adam and Eve were walking through the garden, and God walked with them in the garden, it says they heard his footsteps. So you know it's physical. That means that they were speaking and seeing Jesus. They were speaking with and seeing Jesus in that time. And it's the same thing when Joshua met the angel of the Lord at uh, the Jordan River, when he's bringing the children of Israel into the promised land across the Jordan River. The angel of the Lord meets him. Balaam, same thing. The angel of the Lord stops his donkey. Same thing. Anytime you see him in the Old Testament, this is the same Jesus that hung from the cross and paid the price for your sins because he is the image of the invisible God. It is still Jesus whether he is in the Old Testament or he is in the New Testament. It's Jesus all the way through. Now, second part of the verse, verse 15, the firstborn of all creation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our, all creation. Now, a lot of people have taken this point, firstborn, to mean that Jesus was created. Now, let me show you why that cannot be true. Because this word born can't be taken like that. It can't simply be a case of him being fashioned or made or something like that. Because Jesus claimed to be more than something that is created. He claimed to be God in his own nature. And the way he did that is he said to the scribes and Pharisees, he said, before Abraham was, that's Father Abraham, before either Abraham was, I am. Now, I know in this culture, that doesn't really mean a lot. So if somebody says, I am, okay, I am, absolutely, you are, no doubt. But in that culture, they called God, I am, the great I am. So to say you are, I am, using present tense, that has to be God because God is eternal. 
He wasn't created. He always was. That's why he can say, I am, because he always was. And so Jesus saying that he is I am is saying that he is God. And this is why they crucified him. You know, if Jesus was just a good teacher, that means nothing. Nobody crucifies a good teacher. He was a great teacher. He was a great prophet. They crucified him because he claimed to be God. And his resurrection proves that he was God. He died on that cross, was buried, and three days later, he rose again. And this proves that he is God. So how can Paul say that he is the firstborn of all creation? Well, let's read on here. Verse 16, if we read this together, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. The beginning word in verse 16 is for, but the Greek word for this can also be translated as because. So let's read it begin putting in, or let's read it again putting in because. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, because by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. So I believe Paul here is speaking to the fact that Jesus was there in creation and he was creating and being created through at creation. Because if Jesus is God, that means he had to be at creation. And in Paul's time, just after Jesus's time, this was a huge point of contention for everyone. Because if you can prove that Jesus Christ is God, then you can prove that everything that he did is right. You could prove the whole Bible is right. You could prove that Christianity is the one true religion. Because truth, by definition, is exclusive. You, there's no such thing as truths. No, it's truth. It's central. It's localized. It is exclusive. And so all religions can't be a little bit right and then just a little bit different from each other. I know a lot of people think that all religions are the same and there's just minor differences. No, it's actually on a fundamental basis, all religions are different and superficially the same. No other religion out there claims that Jesus Christ was God and that he died on that cross and that he rose again three days later from the dead and then ascended into heaven. Christianity is the only religion out there that says that Jesus Christ is also God. Not even Judaism, the Jews, claim that he did. They do say that he died on that cross, but they don't say that he rose again late, uh, three days later because if they were to say that, how, how do you explain somebody rising from the dead other than that they are God? So they can't say that. Or they would have to accept Jesus Christ. And there are some Jews that do. There are Messianic Jews or Christian Jews or whatever you want to call them or whatever they call themselves. There are Jews out there that believe in the risen Lord. But as a whole, Israeli Jews don't believe in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They don't claim him as their Messiah. And this is something that even today is a big point of dissension. So Paul is using this as another way to convince us and to convince the Colossian church that Jesus Christ is God. Because if Jesus Christ was at creation and he is creating, then he must be God. Only God was at the creation. But it says, if you look in Genesis 1, it says we. It specifically says we there. And it says the spirit hovered over the waters but my favorite point to prove that Jesus was at the creation is because on day one, God said, let there be light. And there was light. But the sun, the moon, and the stars were created until the fourth day. So how do you have light on the first day if the sun and moon and the stars weren't created until the fourth day? Interesting, right? Well, I'll tell you. It's the same way 
that Revelation, the book of Revelation, says there is going to be light in the new Jerusalem. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He will be the light in the new Jerusalem, and he was the light at creation. He was there. Isn't that amazing? We did a study on Genesis 1 that will be posted here in the next couple of days as well. Um, and it's amazing. It talks about all these great things that prove that Jesus was at creation and how he was creating and being created through. And you see these amazing, amazing facts that prove that he was there. So after this one, we'll have that one up there. Go and take a look at that and it'll tie right in. It's beautiful. It really is. So Paul is simply speaking to the fact that Jesus was there at creation. And he's saying here, all things were created through him and for him and in him, all things consist. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. You see, he is the sustainer of all life. You know, there's a, um, let's see, how do I put this? Ah, an atom. I'm not sure how to put this, but there is a cell. Yeah, it's a cell. There is a cell in our bodies, in every living thing, there is a cell. And I wish I could remember the name of it, but look it up. There's a cell in every living thing. And if you look at it deeply, its structure is a cross. It seriously is. Its very structure in this cell is a cross. In that Specific cell is in every living thing. It holds all things. Oh man, I almost had the name of it too. You know how your brain does that? <laughs> I almost had the name of it. But its structure holds together every living thing. And so it makes this thing that Paul says here, that in him all things consist. He is the sustainer of all life. It makes it real. It makes it for real. It makes it legit. Because he truly is sustaining each one of us and holding us together by the word of his power. That's an amazing, amazing truth that God has woven in. You see, if you look closely and with an open mind and not with a preconceived notion about how the world came to be and how things work themselves out and all these things, if you just look at it and you say to yourself, you know what? I'm just going to look at it and take in what it says, and then I'll make a decision after that. If you come in with no preconceived notion, I guarantee you, you will see that God is the one who has done all this. There is no way that we're just the random, random collocation of, of atoms here. There's no way. It took a grand design. It took a designer. And it took, takes a, a sustainer of life to make all these things happen. They don't just happen by chance. No, it took a grand design and it takes a sustainer to make these things happen. So verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He is the firstborn of the dead that now all the church will be birthed out of death. Remember I said he was our resurrection. He resurrected himself and then gave that resurrection to us. He imparted his righteousness upon us. He imparted his resurrection upon us that we could be with him in heaven for all eternity. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, he has made it possible for us also to have that resurrection. He has made it possible for all of us to go to heaven and be in the presence of the Father with him. Because if you notice, and I found this very interesting, if you notice, if you read the Old Testament, it will talk about when people die, them going to be with their fathers, or to uh, them going to Abraham's bosom, or them going to the center of the earth, or something like that. And that is true. There is a place called Sheol. 
in the center of the earth. And it is to this day the place that everyone who is going to hell and is going to burn in a lake of fire at the final judgment, it's where they're going. Sheol, in the center of the earth. But before Jesus died and was resurrected, the people who were going to heaven with him also went to Sheol. That's where we get this picture of the great chasm. It's the story of um, Lazarus and the rich man. Because Lazarus was a poor man who was begging at the gate, at the rich man's gate. And as people came in and out, he would beg from them. But the rich man enjoyed all the, um, all the, um, whatever you want to call it, all the, all the great things of life. But when they both died, the rich man and Lazarus both went to Sheol, but the rich man went to the bad place and the poor man, Lazarus, went to the good place. And it said in that story that they're in two different places and there's a great chasm between them and there's rest on, on the good side, on the side for the ones that are going to heaven. And then there is eternal burning for the one who is on the bad side, the one that is in hell. It says the rich man begged Abraham to have Lazarus come over and just touch the tip of his tongue with a drop of water. The burning is that bad that he just wanted a drop of water for relief. But Abraham said, we can't get to you and you can't get to us. There's this great chasm in between. But after Jesus dies and he is resurrected, first of all, at his resurrection, it says that thousands of saints came out of the ground and started walking the streets of Jerusalem on that day. This is the Sunday after uh, Passover. So the Passover lamb, Jesus, is slaughtered the Sunday after on the feast, the Sabbath day, the feast of first fruits, the first day of the week. All these people come out of Sheol out of the good place, and they're walking the streets of Jerusalem. And then they ascend into heaven. And now, in the New Testament, you see when somebody dies, they go straight to heaven. They no longer go to the center of the earth, into Sheol. Because Jesus has paid that price, has been resurrected from the dead, and has resurrected the dead out of Sheol to go into heaven and to be with the Father eternally as he sits on the right hand. It says, when he, res when he uh, ascended into heaven, he went to be at the right hand of the Father. And all those people who were waiting for him, all those saints, went to heaven as well with him. So how incredible that, it, that uh, Jesus has done that for him, for us, that we can now go to heaven and be with him. And you know something about this in verse 18 where it says, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. First, you know, that, that used to trip me out because technically he wasn't the firstborn from the dead. I mean, if you even look at the stories of his life, he, what about um, uh, Lazarus? What about Lazarus? He raised, called Lazarus out of the grave, raised him from the dead. What about the little girl? who he raised from the dead. There was people who were born first out of death. And so this always came to my mind, like, how could he say this? How could that be? He is the firstborn of the dead. Other people were born out of death before him. But one day the Lord gave this to me. He is the firstborn from the dead that never died again. He died, was buried, and then was resurrected from the dead, and then went straight to heaven. You see those other people, Lazarus, the little girl, they had to die again. They already had the easy part done. They had that death thing out of the way. But he brought them back from the dead as a tribute to his glory. But then they had to die again. So Jesus is the firstborn of the dead to never die again. And now it says that when we die as Christians, as saints, when we die, 
We go directly to be with him. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's that fast. Just in the snap of a finger, you are absent from your body in death, and then you're present with the Lord. And you go to be with him eternally in heaven. Jesus rose from the dead, ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father. Therefore, he was the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. He is the first and the last. Praise the Lord. God, we thank you so much for this great truth, for this great thing that you've done for us, that we no longer are in the darkness, but are in your glorious light. We no, ha no, no, no longer have to be concerned about death because we know there is life after death. We know you have done this great work. You have died, been buried, and been resurrected and have imparted that resurrection upon us. For all who would believe to him, he gave the right to be called children of God. Praise the Lord. We thank you so much, God. And if there's anyone watching this video who hasn't fully submitted their life to Christ, you can do it so simply. You can do it so easily. You know, for the thief on the cross, all the thief said was, Lord, today, when you find yourself in your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He had the faith. So you can just say something like this in your own heart. Say, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I know that you have paid the price for me. I know that you died, that you were buried, and that you were resurrect re resurrected again to give me new life. And if I just trust in you, you will give me that life and that more abundantly. So God, I trust in you now. I place all my faith and my hope in you. And that just as you are in heaven, when I die, I wanna be with you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. It says that when one person repents and comes to the Lord, all the angels in heaven rejoice. So I rejoice with you as well. I can't wait to be there in heaven with you, singing with the 10,000s upon 10,000s of his saints, praising the Lord for his goodness and his faithfulness in our lives. So praise the Lord. We'll be back finishing up this chapter next week. So look out for that. And I promise I will get Genesis 1, Lord willing, I'll get that posted and that'll be on there too. Watch it after this and you will see these amazing parallels that God has orchestrated into these things that Paul is touching on. So God bless you. Hope you have a great week and we'll see you later. Bye-bye now.